Yeah, a friend of mine, Noel, she just a while ago went, went through this where she had two brothers and they were not usually around, they were traveling a lot and she was left closer to her other end. And she was really very much aware of the of the conditioning and the pattern conditioning in there of taking care of your parents in your old age and her father had passed and and it was like the, the messages were coming from dear old mom about, you know, take care of me and I need you, I need you, I need you. Almost like that's an assumption, you know, it's like part of the, the way it seems with the cycle, you know, when, when children are very young, there's this, there's a need, a dependency. And then it seems to go full circle around to a, a dependency as the body starts to break down, sometimes the mental capacities go and so on and so forth. And Really, it's, it always comes down to authentically, it's not so much avoiding any kind of duties and responsibilities, but as you go for healing, and you go for this very high state of healing, and you start to realize that that's your, really your sole responsibility. Mm -hmm. You're doing this healing for the whole universe. It's not a minor thing. You're doing a huge thing for the whole universe. That you have to be able to trust in the plan that that all things are working together for good as you fulfill your true responsibility. And, and for Noelle, she's done metaphysics for years and, and lots of questioning things. And and really, when she went inside, she didn't feel a call. She felt that she would be acting from guilt mm -hmm. if she did that. And it seemed like her mother protested and so forth. And and when she seemed to pass, it was a very deep time of, of really, she, because Noelle didn't go and, and be there for her mother and everything. She continued on with her, with her inner work and so forth. And where the roots of this are is that, in the Bible it says God is no respecter of persons. Yeah, God didn't create this world. God is pure divine love and light and really has nothing at all in this world. This is a world of idolatry. You know, when they used to say in the Bible, hold no graven images before the Lord thy God, and we thought it might be, okay, don't make totem poles and stay away from gold calves and stuff like that, you know, be safe so you, know, you don't upset God. It's like, no, all of the images of the cosmos are the graven images that have been placed before the Lord thy God. You don't have to worry about the totem poles and the has, including mom and dad. They're part of the idolatry. In fact, I remember when I was reading the Course, it's like, okay, God did not create a meaningless world. All right. Uh, God did not create this world. Oh, well, let's uh, think back to Genesis. I, I'm pretty sure Genesis said God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. Uh, then it goes on a little bit more in the workbook where it says, This world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God could enter not. Okay, now we're getting, it's getting a little stronger language here. A place where God could enter not. So that kind of starts to get my attention. You know, this world was made as an attack on God, a place where God could enter not. I wasn't even reading that when I was reading Veda Vedanta. Other non-dualistic paths. I said, that's that's some really strong language. So what he's saying is, is the world and everything of the world, all the fragmented images and all of the distorted perceptions and everything, it's a place where God can enter not. We have to bring the darkness of our fragmentation to the light and let it disappear. We can't keep calling on God to enter in to this fragmentation. And then I started to realize. It's like, when I started to ponder this thing about my mother and my father, my loyalties to them, and, and all that they did for me, and all of these ties, these strong ties of the heart to mom and dad, I started to kind of uh, get this thing from the spirit. It was like, if you put it in kind of light terms, it's like, who's your dad? <laughs> And uh, I said, what? And it's like, it's like, 
who is your source? And I was like, God's my source. And it's like, yeah, you can't have two sources. You can only have one source. In this world, it seems like mom and dad are the source. That's what babies come from. That's where children come and so on and so forth. Sex and so on and so forth. All that begat stuff in the Bible. Begat, 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 begat. That's, that's all false causation because you can't have two sources. You know. And you notice during those you know, three years of Jesus' public ministry, when he really accepted who he was. You know, you know, the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You know, that kind of stuff. Who's your daddy? Every day, every moment of Jesus' public mission was an expression of who's your daddy. It was all pointing back to the source, to the true source, to the real source. And this world of time and space was made in direct opposition to that. It was basically saying, you don't have an eternal source, you have a physical source. You know, if, you, if you go to a bar and somebody comes up to you and they say, where were you born? There's a time-space answer. Where did you come from? You know, if you say what country, what parents, what culture, what ethnicity, that's all false causation. That has really nothing to do with reality at all. So when I started to realize that I couldn't have two sources, that I could only have one source, and it had to be so, then I thought, wow, I've, I'm going to have to quit hiding and protecting and keep guarding, I'm going to have to stop guarding these concepts that are make-believe, that are hiding me and shielding me from remembering my true source. Now once you get at that level, then it starts to kick in that service to the One, literally aligning with the One, is our total responsibility. And it played out that way in the parable of David, in the sense that when it came to the point when the bio, my biological father was was going down, 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 and actually had lapsed into a coma. It was intensive care in the hospital. I happened to be, on all my world travels, I happened to be swooping by the hometown, and just in town when that was occurring. So the biological mother and the biological sister said, come, come to the hospital, come to the intensive care unit, and, and come. And so I did. I went in there, and there, there was Jack in a coma. As soon as I walked into the intensive care, and as soon as I walked in there, guess what happened? He came right out of the coma and started talking to me. Talk about the zombies. I guess I was that's the <laughs> zombies phase because this wasn't even a, a laying a comatose zombie or a walking zombie. This was he just came right up and he started talking about about what I was up to and where are you going to be going next day? Where, where are you going to be going to next? And I said, well, in Florida, and this and that. And we both knew that I was going to be around for the funeral, uh, even. You know, let the dead bury the dead. Uh, it was one of those kind of experiences where it was such a beautiful connection and such joy. And that was the last time that I saw him. Then I was off, you know. And that's why Jesus, you know, everybody does, a lot of times doesn't like that. That phrase, you know, let the, let the dead bury the dead, that he tells the, the man in the Bible. But when you think of it, Jesus, the presence of the Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. It is life. And imagine if you are life itself, and something comes to you and says, I, I'm sorry, I can't be with you right now, I can't follow you now, eternal life, uh, because I gotta go bury this body over here. See how silly. That sounds to turn away from eternal life and the teachings of eternal life to go bury, to put a body in, into the ground. That's you know, kind of ridiculous. But from the ego's perspective, that sounds a little harsh. Let the dead bury the dead. Imagine that was said with full love and joy and presence. Let the dead bury the dead. You know, stay with me. 
stay with the presence of eternal life. There's much to learn from eternal life. So, really the question for you is, the way out of it all is, again, as you tune into the Spirit, and you say, what would you have me do? What would you have me say? Where would you have me go? You may get guided from time to time to visit Mom, or to call Mom. You know, that can very well be part of the guidance, but there shouldn't be a heaviness around it. If it feels like you're sacrificing, if it feels like you're compromising, if it feels like there's, there's a calling that you're pushing aside to do the good duty thing, you know, everything, that actually is people pleasing as well. And remember our goal and our purpose is to, to share, let the Spirit speak through us and share this love and wisdom and to really let those interactions be full let them really be holy encounters, but when, when the ego tries to lure you into it, you know, you can be firm and just say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. 